Yeah. If you could say your name, then what scale do you um, monitor? Cosby and I scale and see. Farm and Mark. Farm and Mark, and I know that name. He's a train vendor. As of today, we only have 14 more tables left to sell. Okay. The big thing now is we're looking for the volunteers to help pull this off. Okay? So come on, our people, we're going to have free admission for coming and volunteering. Okay? So if you come and volunteer on Friday, come back Saturday and you for free. Okay? Send it out around four o'clock today and instructional email, which will give you the times, how to get there, and everything. Okay, also, you will have my um, email. So, if you have any questions, I'm there to answer. Okay, but uh, we're, we're, we're working on it. We're people, we have a lot of people out here, so we're moving forward. All right, okay. All right, thank you. Let's uh let's have Jim Golden next speak. So first thanks to the twenty-five folks who have already signed up to support the Piedmont pilgrimage. Your pipe ads are all on the pilgrimage webpage on your supporters. If you would like to have your pipe ad added to the supporter page. I'm the person to see. I'll be walking around. Ten dollars, your bike ad goes up. If you already have a bike uh, card, a PDF. If you need a card, if you need cards printed from an existing design, that's an extra five dollars. If you need to have a card designed, eighteen dollars total for the design and printing five cards. Then putting your card up on the Piedmont Pilgrimage webpage supporters. I'll be walking around and you can hit me up. Thank you. All right. We are going to hear, well, let's see. I talked to John Hayden. He is now in Cincinnati. Um, he may post up the speed model complex call, but he um, has been donating to again. So it is gone. We are going to be in contact here for the end of our month. Okay. Kim, was there any change with the photo? No. That's going to be online only. Okay. If the photo content you need to go on, but the tools are there, and you can um, submit to um, Jim Dad. Uh, 
Oh, the two My name is Brenda Watts. I am the region AP manager. I am standing in tonight. Mason is in some country somewhere in this world, which I do not know where he's vacation, and I have a Golden Spike Award sent to one of our region members tonight. For Anybody that doesn't know anything about the Golden Spike Award, it was approved by the National on January 1987. Golden Spike Award has been around for a few years. They thought that it would be a good idea to have an award at the entry level to the achievement program. Now, anyone good standing does it take a committee member of your division AP program, probably as a chairman, does it take one of those members to evaluate your layout for those spots? Any member can go in and evaluate another member's layout for the those spots award. And there's several rules that you need to qualify for. You can have six units of roller stock, has to be something other than shake the box, and that's about putting KD cover on it, metal wheel set, little battery, and that would qualify. You don't want to have to judge, you don't have to see them run on your layout. It's just for it. And the second element of it is scenery and structure. A minimum of eight square feet. That's very small, that's all you need. You have to have five structures. They don't have to be scrap fit. Just put on your laid out a little weather and only that qualifies. Civil and motor. You have to have three kinds of traffic. It doesn't have to be the same three types of traffic. It can be three or six turnouts. That would qualify for it. And there's one other element that you have to have one other electrical component. It could be a quarter switch motor. It could be a signal. It could be an LED on your patient. Would qualify. So the regs for the Golden Spike is very simple. So tonight, it is my pleasure to set the Golden Spike Award to the Division of Member, Gary Fish. Gary, will you come up Gary, congratulations. Hard work. Bring your golden spike award. Pleasure to find something. In Charlie, here's your own book. Oh, Sally, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, yes. Uh, I'm Mike Deaton. I'm a second year now running the uh, Piedmont Total Range for everybody. Uh, we're going to have a real one this year with people, uh, different houses, and person guests. There will be some COVID restrictions, which will be posted on the website along with all the other nationwide tours. Uh, but just for those of you who haven't been caught up on the Piedmont Total Range for this year, we are having our open houses uh, beginning on Saturday, October 23rd. Going uh, Saturdays and Sunday weekends there through uh, Sunday, November 21st. So, graph by geographic, but all over the metro line here. Try to treat them as best that we could. Okay, so we're going to have, uh, at this point, we have 36 open house tours on the schedule, and we're going to have seven virtual layout tour videos that are new this year. For those of you who were kind enough to do a video last year, those are also on the website. We have a special page that will take you to our YouTube channel uh, where those can be viewed. So all uh, and the 50, 60, something we had last year uh, will also be available for people to go to the uh, YouTube channel and view those. Uh, that's uh, uh, it's very important. I'll make this very clear. If you don't hear anything else from tonight about pilgrimage, please go to the website www.monthclerkmitch.com and all the scheduling information about the directions where the layouts are, the times, the uh, any code districts the host have that may require you to wear a mask. They may, uh, we have several different outdoors, so that's not a problem, of course. Uh, if there are restrictions, we certainly expect our guests to all observe those, be cooperative, and, and comply, and make the, uh, the, the host comfortable. Uh, so, and of course, that difference is all subject to change. Uh, tours may become canceled for some reason. So, before you go on any of the tours, you see a schedule that says so and so is at 11 a.m. on Saturday, whatever. Please check that on the website before you actually go. Very important. Um, the podcasts. So, I won't that again, but see them if you want one. Uh, if you need signs, I have three signs for. Uh, Robert Meyer, are you here? Uh, I have your signs. I'll get those for you. If anybody else is on our tour and they need to sign, I have, I have plenty of people here overstock on signs. If you just think you'd like to have an extra one, please let me know. I have plenty of signs. I have a good half dozen or so that I can get those out signing. Uh, finally, operator assistance. Uh, Tom Gordon is in charge for operator assistance this year. Uh, he reports that uh, we have not had much demand, but interested in participating or you're a host who needs an operator system to help you with your uh, operator. Um, yeah, well that, that's somebody cut out. Uh, please uh, get in touch with Tom. Tom will take care of you if you need assistance or if you want to be one. Uh, Tom will have all that we need. And uh, any questions about the Piedmont government for this year? Yes sir Randall. Me, contact me. Anyone, if you got any updates this month, the slightest old thing, on what, everything is up on the web page now except for the, the sub videos. All the open houses are posted. Go to the website, write your host, see what's there. If you want to add anything, change anything, uh, it helps you send it what you want in the format it is now. Just change the words. Uh, of course, any pictures, try to keep those under like a half a megabyte, maybe 500 KB or so. Uh, they get too big, slow to load, and it bogs, bogs down the website. Um, but yeah, so that's me, Randall. I'm happy to vote for it. Yeah, uh, well, mainly, like, if we have, uh, there's like the layout description grid, copy that, add up the information, and just send that grid to me. Uh, yes, please. It's about 100 KB, it's good enough. If they're too, too low resolution, they don't look very good. And if they're, they're two megabytes or three megabytes, they just take forever to load. Any more questions? I want to thank my volunteers for hosting this year. I know we covered and everything is kind of uncomfortable and scary at times. Uh, if you are a host, you decide you're just not into it, you just don't want to do it after all, just let me know as soon as you make that decision and we'll mark your tour as canceled. But we, we hope this is going to go forward. People will all be great, cooperative, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking with what's going on, it's not going to be too crowded, um, but never know. So, be prepared for the worst or the best. If we had to turn out, that's great. Thanks, Sally.
Just briefly, the South Eastern Railroad Museum is a little started in five years college. But the little bias has been going on since five to the public since 70. They have this show. 25,000 to 30,000 people a year coming, primarily a educational institute, a 501c3 organization. You will begin to see more uh, information about it. Typically, a campaign like this, they run the insiders first until they built up somewhat of a war chest, and then it'll expand. There's a lot of involvement from Gwinnett County folks, a lot of people in the organization that are helping to make this thing go. Thank you. bunch of names playing here that oh my gosh what? so I would appreciate being looked at if you know people if you think you know people what she does in there he um you know I would say I know George Carter we have to say we have to and the shit that work The public, you're not going to be. Okay, okay. So, anyway, just wanted to pass that along to you. Um, John Stevens is now a director of Puzzles. Um, that was uh, announced at the FDR convention. And I have uh, one more important thing that I need to do. Somebody in here got the <laughs> the FDR convention. So let me see if you have a word for it. The Mueller Award goes to somebody in a division level that has done. Here we go. They're walking to their. Okay, who got Oh, okay, Charlie. Well, they Sally said to bring the uh, building server that has details of dark transfers on them. Um, this building is a general store, Walter's Cornerstone. Uh, they included details in the kit, but I didn't want to put them on the store because that's a nice model to have those details on it. But I put the details on them. And the neat thing was, which I didn't expect, I put the decals on and then did the uh, bomb effect to the next little in. All the gaps between the boards opened up. And this red one actually tried sanding it. Oh, and it quite nice, uh, warm look. Uh, on the general store, these were. Uh, Dry transfers from Clover House, this old time, except uh, they have a uh, paper sort of poster type thing. Uh, generally, they're too thick fine, so you have to sand them with a fine sandpaper, get them thin, soak them in water, put them white and mess them in the flabbers quite nicely. And the last one, the same kind of thing, um, this is a paper ad. Sanded it thin and then put it on the floor. Two examples of decals and uh, dry transfers, most of Okay. So now for the 
meeting. So we're going to take a 60 minute break. And then we're going to go back at 7.45 and view our clinic with Matt. Stop here right now. Matt is going to wait for me first. So we'll call you back at 7.45. Yeah, I too. One of our goals is to build nice gifts or scrap builders. We want to do some lettering to that letters on the wood decals. Okay, so this presentation down to basically three. Uh, part to so give a talk, or I'm going to talk a little bit about detail. And then, like uh, Sally mentioned, when it shows there's a lot of questions about how to get started with airbrushing. That's why I wanted to touch on the paint and also about airbrushing. So, model that somebody has painted with our paint, picture is posted on our site. The gentleman did an excellent job of one of the and out in California. He also has a website where he shows his and demonstrates his fully free models. So, oops, okay. First up, when we talk about details, a lot of people 
just use the word decals. And to be clear, if you want to go on the internet and do any searching about it, most of the time we're doing water slide decals. And I know they said Charlie had mentioned his buildings over here. I know that Charlie does also dry transfer through. So there's two types of decals that we most commonly use in the model railroad. It's a water slide decal, and we've also done other things. So with water slide decals, if you folks remember, we used to have champ decals coming out of business. Now you can buy their decals on a secondary market on eBay, etc. Also, Microscale is another provider of decals. They're still around, although sometimes it is hard to find the specific set of decals that you wanted. Both of these are water slide decals. There is a new game player in town, uh, probably from the Tension Train Group that makes a lot of nice little train car kits, etc. And they have recently started making decals to fill that void left by Chino. And if you haven't gone to their website recently, I highly encourage it. Every time I've gone to their website, they've got more and more decals in their library. And if I'm not mistaken, on their website, they also offer to print custom decals. So if you have your file, which we're going to talk about a little bit here, uh, you can have them print it for you. Be uh, clear on water slide decals. You're, this is a cross-section through the paper. It's a piece of paper with a dextrose adhesive, which holds the, the, uh, the filament onto the paper until the water comes in, softens that dextrose, which is a certain type of material, and then that your decal is slide on the glue, which represents you the actual decal that you're trying to transfer onto your model. So, just to highlight a couple of other manufacturers, Woodland Seeds provide the dry leather dry transfers and also Clover House, another maker of dry transfer decals. Uh, usually people prefer one or the other. I know some people like a dry transfer. They're actually very simple to use, but sometimes they put kind of a larger filament on the model instead of uh, going down onto the model like you can get with your water slide details. So, if you want to make your own decals and print them, one of our biggest problems is having white pigment because printers typically do not have white pigment. So, anybody in the steam air, that was a real hang up because back in the steam age, they did a lot of pink parts or labeling with white paint. Let's see here. Skipping a little bit further than I wanted, but it, um, okay, we'll go with this slide. Um, it used to be in yesteryear, a lot of people would refer to the Alps printer in order to print white decals. Uh, the Alps printer was almost two decades ago now. That's a long time ago. It was a company out of Japan. It's the Alps Corporation. And the system was called MicroDrive, in case you want to look it up. Internet, that is the key words to look for. And they actually had a ribbon cartridge that would slide in front of the head, and then that's how you would transfer ink onto the decal paper. These printers are still around. People will print decals for you. They're advertised in model railroad magazines, etc. And uh, this car here was printed with, or I should say the decals were done with Okay, Micromark. If you're familiar with them, they came out a while back with a printer cartridge. Anybody familiar with this? Did anybody get one or try it? I 
been kind of curious. They advertise them. Um, not here. Okay. This is a what they refer to as a ghost white printer cartridge that you could put into your HP printer and therefore print white decals. Now, when this concept is used, because there's also Xerox does a similar thing, their print is about $7,000. The printers are much more reasonable in price down in the 200. But as I mentioned, this printer is no longer made um, unless you can find one in the secondary market someplace. So um, for this those white cartridge, what I came across was this company, which is actually over in Europe, and the patient had to get a this presentation. It's up in here where I did the search, and it's ghostwhitetoner.com, European com company that makes that ghost white cartridge. And if you go to their support, they actually had a number of printers that they actually make these cartridges for. Now I say make the cartridge. My discussion with them, and what I gathered is, is that they're taking recycled cartridges and filling them with white pigment, and then they're putting them back out on the market. So they only do it for printers that they can get a lot of cartridges for. So, when we were in the business of printing decals, my wife would always get this question. She would get this picture and people would say, can you print this as a decal for me? Well, the answer is this. This can be printed as a decal. The downside is a picture of this stream card on a water slide big decal. And that's not actually what you want. And likewise, if you're sending your file to somebody to have them print it for it or print it for you, you want to change your file into small letter fonts or shapes that the computer is going to pick up and be able to print as um, the decals that you actually want. So just again, uh, the person that did this decal set, he actually created the circle, had to put the lettering in, the fonts, etc., and created that unique lettering because there actually wasn't a shine in the Northern Railway. He did that for himself and he did that for his model railway plan. So, just to highlight the graphic artwork, because when people would ask, can you print this as a decal? The next question is, is can you change it into the shapes and letters that decal? Yes, there are people who will do that, and it's called a graphic artwork. It's very time consuming, and if you're paying them, it's going to be somewhat costly. If you're into computers and you'd like to, can be done with Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, and Microsoft Excel simply by using the, the drawing format of those softwares. So you create a circle, then you take the, the circle part out, make it transparent, end up with a circle around your um, shape or whatever you're going to put in there. You can actually go in and take the letters. And I did this very crudely. I just took the, the mouse and made a shape. And then it's made up of a bunch of little points. And you can manipulate those little points and move them all around until you get the letter just how you want it. Then you can squeeze it down, color it different. You can take that shape, merge it over to this shape, and group them together. So you can do it very time consuming. And once they're made into a shape, then you can actually send them to somebody like Kitchen Train or any of the other providers that will print it for you. There is some other options too. So this is actually a picture of a Northern Pacific stock car. And you can see the lettering up there. And this lettering right here across this stock car is one that I did. And long behold, uh, New Times Roman matched fairly well. If you look very closely, you'll notice that some of the letters are right. But for most people, there's that good enough, it's okay. First, though, 
I looked and looked and looked after a couple of hours, I just gave up and said, hey, those numbers are gonna be mine and I won't take it out. Great Northern, another example, they use more like an aerial plot. So you can adjust that on height for the different letters, get it how you like it and then send it off and have them printed for you. There's some other options that on the internet, you can go in and look for railroad plots and for about 10 to 20 dollars you can buy a specific uh, Okay, sorry about that. So with railroad fonts, you can go in and buy the railroad fonts, like I said, about 10 to $20. And there's all kinds of uh, different railroads that somebody has gone in, taken those letters, graphic artwork, changed them into a font, so then you only have to type them out, and lo and behold, you have that, that mortgage. Um, the one thing that we did come across, though, is, is that when somebody was using, say, a unique railroad font, um, and we didn't have it, then, again, we couldn't print their decals. They, we would have to transfer that font to the person that's going to do the printing. Okay, so that kind of summarizes the decals. Uh, is there any thoughts, that, questions, anybody wants any short questions? Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Water slide. Okay, so I, I showed that cross section of the water slide. Um, on that concept, you basically have water that moves in, softens the depth growth or glue, and the filament will slide off the paper. You have a, a piece of filament that is actually going to be to the water. The dry transfer, the ink is put on the paper, leave it a reverse pattern because when you put it down on the model, you take something and rub it on, and the, the, the glue that you're massaging will make that pigment stick to the model, and then you pull the paper back off, but the, the leathering will actually stay on the model. So, in summary, the dry letter transferring can be less messy, takes less tools. The trick is, so to get it all lined up before you start rubbing it, because if you start rubbing it and then realize that it's not quite where you want, you don't get to move it. Whereas the water slide decals get to slide into place, and then you can move them after the fact if they quite in line. Then you Set them down in other types of setting, but anyway, yes. Uh, actually, the champ decals I have that are basically that old, the champs held up fairly well. Did yours tend to break up or okay? Well, the champs I have found did fairly well, even as old as they are. The micro scale, though, that I've I've got some are as many as thirty years old. I found that those tend not to hold up near as well. They're very very fragile. Um, handling very carefully was the secret. Although honestly, I don't know that I would do it again. If they're if they were that old, it was just too much um, frustration compared to the benefit. One other, and it's a good point you bring up, there is a difference between microscale and champ. Microscale actually puts down some kind of a, a mastic material and then put the decal on top of it. So it's not the plastic filament that most people consider when you talk about water slide decals. This, it was a mastic that they sprayed down and then it hardened in a clear, I suspect, a, um, like, what we're gonna actually talk about paints, it's probably some kind of an acrylic plastic that they sprayed down and it dries. 
So good question, though. Yeah. Okay. Speed width. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Another another option, and um, you know these these things are great and appreciated, um, especially if you had models to share with us that that uh, showed how that was done. That'd be great. Uh, yes. What's that? The dry transfer, um, in my opinion, and what I've heard people say, it's a matter of choice. It's what you become familiar with and how to handle. And as we as we move on to paint, um, you're going to find there's a lot of personal preference on how and what to do. So, um, okay. So when we talk about paint, um, yes, I'm sorry. Well, and again, that's that's kind of that tricky statement. My wife didn't want to create the decal. She only wanted to be able to print the decal for people. So you, the person themselves needed to create the decal, and then she was just a printing format. And that's really relatively inexpensive. But go ahead. What was your... <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of glitches. <laughs> uh, one thing that we ran across that decal paper here in the United States is no longer available, which was really uh, a, a heartbreak because when we started, there was like two or three manufacturers and um, they started going out of business and we would have to go to the next decal paper company and the price kept going up. And every time you would go to a new decal paper, you had to do all the testing to make sure that it would work, whether, it, you know, the thickness was also another issue that came into play. Some of them had a lot thicker filament that just wouldn't lay down. If you've ever used champ decals, and on the picture I had there, champ decals used a fairly heavy filament. Um, one of the reasons they don't break up as easily. But if you go with a lot thinner filament, it is going to be more prone to breaking or tearing on you. So there was just so many things to test, and when it just came down to it, their, their profit margin just, it just, she was working for free many, many, many times and just said enough. So, but good question, thanks. Um, so moving on to paint, because actually we had two parts and uh, just, I'll fill in real quick. So what happened was, is I wanted some decals, so she helped me make some decals, and that worked out so great that I ended up using all the cars that I had painted, so I needed some paint, and by then, if you recall, Floquil had gone out of business, so we couldn't get Floquil paint, and also the other choice was uh, Scale Coat, which was another provider of paint. Uh, both of these are what we would refer to as a um, hydrocarbon solvent based paint. And you also might be aware, and I'm just tossing this out as a tidbit, if you were using these two different types of paint, even though there were hydrocarbon solvent based paints, you weren't supposed to mix an enamel paint with a uh, lacquer paint. So Flocal, the takeaway from this slide, Flocal is a lacquer paint, Scale Coat is an enamel paint. So you didn't want to mix them. and the most important thing on that slide is that when you use this type of paint, it required very good ventilation. And if you know now that the hydrocarbons that were used in this paint, is this, yeah, when the hydrocarbons used in this paint can be hazardous. And um, yeah, just that note over there that you can't mix the two. Okay, 
So a couple of years back, if you noticed, a few acrylic paints started coming onto the market. That's because acrylic glue became available. And so different paint companies started using it. You started seeing the acrylic colors store start to show up in craft stores. You also notice that your paint that you would buy at the big box uh, hardware stores like Bear at Home Depot, uh, they kept getting better and better on uh, different levels of quality of paint, which we'll cover here in just a few minutes. But most important when it comes to acrylic paints, they're very low odor. Um, and in fact, there's really no harmful chemicals associated with them. I know that, for example, the acrylic paints that they sell at your craft stores, technically you're supposed to be able to eat them and not have any problem. That's one of the reason they get to be at the craft stores. Um, the other thing about acrylic paints, and I'm sure you're all familiar, if you had the choice of painting uh, at your house, would you use a latex paint or do you wanna paint your rooms with oil-based paints? And most of us all use latex paints now. And the reason is, is because it's so easy to clean up. And again, with uh, acrylic craft paint, so much easier to, to clean up after you're done painting. So one of the things that was very interesting to me as time has gone on and finding out about paint, when we think of paint, we think of a fluid, but paint is actually not a fluid. In fact, there's glue in it, then there's solid pigments, dyes, carriers, and additives. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that because in order to paint and be successful, it's unclear to me that it's really good to know your paint and understand what's going on. So first up are the pigments. So the pigments are like, for example, when you paint white paint, you're using titanium oxide. And you can just look down through the different compounds here and match it up with the different colors that you have. And so those are the different compounds that are being used. But to keep in mind, these are pigments. And when I say pigments, these are actually little tiny pieces of material. And they're, they're ground up very fine. And another thing to keep in perspective, the finer the pigments, the more expensive. So when you buy a can of house paint and you see a crack in your wall when you're painting and you wanna fill that crack and you could swipe your brush across and it filled it up and you're going right on, I didn't need to put it spackle and fix it all up. Well, that's great, but those pigments are a lot larger then when you take the pigments in your hobby and you smear it on your model and it'll cover up all your cracks, you don't want that. So remember those pigments are uh, a big player as far as how fine they are in order to use them in your, your modeling. Another thing that was kind of interesting, uh, anybody familiar with SG, the acronym SG, the uh, stands for specific gravity, do we? You know what specific gravity stands for? Okay, so a number greater than one means that it's gonna sink in water. A number light, uh, smaller than one means it'll float in water. But notice these different specific gravities of these compounds. If you ever pick up a black bottle of paint, you'll notice that, that it seems to distribute fairly well when you shake it. Um, the specific gravity for carbon is down around two to three. So it stays suspended a lot easier than something that's got a specific gravity of nine, which is gonna settle out rather quickly. Uh, just to summarize here, in case I don't mention it later, one of the more difficult things about acrylic paint is, is you've gotta mix it more. Keep that, those particles in suspension. They don't necessarily wanna stay in suspension. There we go. Okay, dyes. These are the different colors that you might want. Uh, this is the source of where they would come from. And most important on this slide, the takeaway is that pigments are those particles that are floating around in your paint, whereas dyes are more of a diluted substance that's gonna be a lot lighter and it's gonna be more distributed through your paint. That's why you can pick up a bottle of green. Green is a kind of a interesting color. We'll talk about it in a second. 
but you'll see different dyes in the paint versus the different pigments where the pigments have all settled out. Find that magical place where I'm supposed to touch to. It's not changing, is it? Okay. Hmm. Okay, we'll try. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So, one of the other interesting things, remember back when we were all in grade school and the teachers told us about primary colors? You had red, blue, and yellow, and you mix them together and you'd get purple if you mix red and blue, et cetera, et cetera. Well, one of the most interesting things that I found frustrating was when you tried to mix blue and yellow, you did not get green. And it's like, what happened? Why didn't this happen correctly? Because that's what we were told all those many years. Well, there's a difference. When you have white light coming through a prism, green is going to be between red and blue. But when light is reflected off of a surface, it doesn't always reflect correctly. So in pigments and dyes and everything about paint, when you mix yellow and green or yellow and blue, uh, you get kind of a washed out looking green. It doesn't come up green. The moral of this story is, is that when you want to mix your colors and say you want a blue green color, try to pick two colors that you're going to mix together so that you're only mixing two colors together and they're very close to the one that you're, you're shooting for. Okay. Yes, it changed. So carriers. Uh, as we've already mentioned, there's two types of carrier. It's going to be the uh, oil base, uh, so it'd be the hydrocarbon solvents and oil, and then you can have alcohol and water, which are the water-based paints. Um, the carrier, represented by the blue, big blue circle, is basically the part that makes your paint fluid, and then you've got uh, the pigments, the glue, and the dye. And to finish up, we're going to talk about the glue now because, oh, one other slide in here first, uh, water-based paints. So just remembering back the years that you remember water-based paints, everybody called them latex, um, represented water-based paints. Early on, it was uh, polyvinyl acetate that made up the glue in your latex paint. Uh, surprisingly, Polyvinyl acetate is a water-based, but I should say water-soluble glue, and that's why it was always considered latex paint was for interior, is because you couldn't use it exterior because the glue was water-soluble and would wash off. Along came a polymer, uh, referred to as an acrylic polymer, um, they also sometimes call it acrylic resin on the internet. And this material actually is resistant to water once it's cured. And we're going to talk about it just a little bit more here. So this statement was so important that I didn't want to memorize it and say it. But if there's anything from their presentation, I hope we can take this um, and remember it. So the binder used to make the acrylic paints are acrylic polymers. Acrylic polymers are a type of plastic. An emulsion occurs when the droplets of the acrylic polymer are evenly dispersed and suspended. And this is most important. They aren't dissolved in the water. They're dispersed and suspended in another liquid. In this case, we're going to use water-based paints the emulsion is uh, formed by tiny acrylic polymer spheres suspended in the water. So your glue, a lot of us think that that glue is, is dissolved and then the water disappears and the glue now is present to bind something. And in actuality, it's an emulsion and those little spheres are floating around in there and that's why 
it's so important to mix your paint really well. And acrylic paints, you actually need in a, a mechanical mixer. Um, I thought this slide was kind of interesting. The only thing I ever remember from high school chemistry, the uh, teacher one time said, when ice goes from ice to water and then water back to ice, that's a physical reaction. So you can think of the polyvinyl acetate resin, that's a physical reaction because it can go back and forth and uh, be reversed. The chemical reaction is like the acrylic polymer, and that was like an egg frying. So when you fry an egg, it always stays as a fried egg. It won't go back into a soft egg, and that's a chemical reaction. Uh, one of the other things that uh, they didn't talk too much about in high school chemistry, but they talk a little bit more in uh, uh, college chemistry, is when you have a polar attraction, and that's like a magnet, so your little molecule, in our case, we're talking about those little spheres of glue that are um, the, the acrylic polymer, it's going to have a little slight charge potentially, so when they sit down on the bottom of the bottle, they don't go back in suspension. Uh, one of the benefits of the solvent-based paints, like scale coat and Floquil, those paints go back into suspension very quickly, very easily, but acrylic paints won't. Um, also molecular attraction, that's when the two little particles just don't have enough fluid to distribute and they just like each other and so they'll stay bonded. Again, the emphasis here is, is that acrylic paint takes a lot more energy in order to put all those little particles back into suspension as well as create that glue back into the emulsion that you would want when you spray it. Okay, so in summary, if you go to airbrushing and you're having problems, initially there was three suggestions that I had for you. Dilute your paint, dilute your paint, dilute your paint. It was, it was pretty simple. 90% of all your problems would be solved if you just keep diluting your paint. Now, in actuality, you dilute your paint a little bit, you can mix your paint. Now, diluting your paint, why you would do it just a little bit, they called it refreshing your paint. And so you put in just a little bit of, of carrier that's going to dilute your paint, and that causes that molecular and polar bonding to be disrupted. And so when you mix it, it just dilute or it mixes easier and faster. Uh, so a mechanical mixer, then you want to filter your paint because that's always good when you're going to use an airbrush is to filter your paint. And then if in doubt, dilute it. If in doubt, dilute it some more. It's just great to dilute your paint. Okay. So why do we want to airbrush? Well, first of all, when you use an acrylic paint, if you have or tried acrylic paint on plastic, it tends to glob up and, and just not go down very nicely. So airbrushing can give you a very nice painted surface. It can go on very smooth. You can build it up to be an opaque uh, covering, or you can put it on very thin, uh, very thinned paint, and this is like 95% carrier or alcohol to 5% paint, and you can get that weathering a look. Now, Something else that I thought really interesting, when a person looks at this structure, and you might recognize this, this is a woodland scene structure, and you look at this structure, it's been airbrushed, and there's some telltale secrets of why it has been airbrushed. Anybody spot any by chance? But I'll just fill you in. Notice this brickwork. It all started out to be one color, and you'll notice that there's some little black sapphire shapes uh, that have been painted above each window. Now, seriously, in real life, how would you ever end up with little black round circles above every window? You, unless this building had been on fire and soot had come up there, chances are that that just wouldn't happen that way. But when you see that structure and it's been painted one color for the brick and then somebody's come along and accented it with black in this case, 
and just gave it some definition, details, whatever you want to call it. Um, also notice that somebody took the airbrush and just went right down through the middle of the windows right there because there's a black spot right, right across the, the windows. Likewise, over in this area, some of the spots are a little, little heavier. Why I'm pointing that out is because in all actuality, it's not the way it would be in real life, but it highlights certain things. It draws your eye to it, and that's the artwork of applying paint and making details jump out at you. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. And so, as many people have experienced, you get your airbrush out, you put some paint in it, and long and behold, it plugs up and you're frustrated and gets stuck back on the shelf. In fact, you can buy on eBay um, airbrushes that often are clogged up and they go for rather inexpensive because they don't work. <laughs> but in actuality, they're fairly easy to clean. So the point to this is, is we've already talked about paint. Paint is a lot of little particles. And if you pressurized it, you would actually do sandblasting, right? You know, that's, that's a concept of sandblasting. If you took a fluid and you put it in a pressure device, that would be pressure washing. So when it comes to paint, we're going to take both of those concepts and we're going to mix glue with it, put it all into this little airbrush and expect it to come out. Um, it's going to be a fluid in the airbrush and like a few inches from your object, you want it to stick there and not move. That's a lot to ask for. So let's just talk about the airbrush a, a minute because the airbrush is a big factor in making an enjoyable experience. So first of all, if you have a gravity flow type of airbrush for acrylic paint, I encourage you to um, go with this concept so that it makes it a more enjoyable uh, event when you do your airbrushing. Uh, Gravity flow means the paint source is above the air outlet. The siphon flow airbrush is the paint source below the air outlet. We'll talk just a little bit more. There's a picture of what's... Okay, um, the other type of airbrush that I highly recommend you have the choice between a single action and a dual action. And for acrylic paint, you'd want to go with a dual action airbrush. It makes life so much more enjoyable. Doesn't mean that you can't use the other types of airbrushes, but you're going to have to be a little bit more careful on uh, a few things. Hopefully, uh, it'll be explained as we move along here. So in your double action gravity flow airbrush, um, that's the picture of the internal works here. But this is a picture I wanted to talk about. Notice that your paint source, now this happened to be a siphon flow. Your paint is drawn up through this cavity and then it comes out along the needle. In a single action airbrush, that needle is pulled away from the, the venturi, which is defined right here at the end. And when you stop the air from moving, Gravity will pull your paint back down into the reservoir. And therefore, as the paint is going back down, it draws air in and will actually have air in these very small uh, cavities that will allow that paint to start to cure and harden. Remember, your acrylic paint is not going to go back into suspension as easily as a solvent based paints. And so when you Pull the knee, or when you start the air flowing again and it has to suck that paint up, you're going to get that scum that started to dry and it's going to get right down here to the tip and it's going to plug up your airbrush. The double action airbrush actually moves the needle down into the tip and closes off that little venturi or the hole where the paint is and it closes it off and acts as a valve so air can't go back down in there. Very important to help you when you're, you're um, airbrushing. Uh, this is just another picture. When you're airbrushing with this type of an airbrush, the air is flowing around the internal um, venturi there, 
and it's pulling this paint down along the needle. It pulls it down to a very fine point and then it creates this cone. Whenever you see painting or work done like this, you can tell that this was done with a double action airbrush because they start with a very small amount of paint by just barely pulling the trigger back a little bit and you can make larger and larger uh, uh, dots. And then th this is called artwork because this is called the dagger stroke. And once you master the dagger stroke in airbrushing, then you can kind of consider yourself an artist. When you, when you look on the internet for how to do artwork with airbrushing, this is, this is one of the keys. Do a dagger stroke and be able to do that. And you're, you're on your way to becoming a famous artist. Okay. The last one is internal mixing airbrushes versus the external. Uh, the only reason I wanted to show this is that when you look at a lot of videos on Meta, um, model railroader, uh, that they, they show the guy that's always doing those always has this type of airbrush. He uses a lot of solvent-based paints. And I'm saying that, hey, that's great for solvent-based paints, but if you're gonna use acrylic paints, I would shy away from I would shy away from it because, again, your paint's going to go back into the cup. It can harden, uh, creating that scum that's going to get blown out. Um, and also, one of the other things is the needle is protruding up into the airflow. And as the air goes around the needle, it can also cause some uh, funky things happening in comparison to a needle where the air is coming out all around the needle. So internal versus external. I recommend the internal, but that's actually uh, simplified because if you go with, if you go with this type of an airbrush with the gravity flow, it is going to have the internal mixing uh, aspect. And they also need to make it double action because they need to move the needle down into the nozzle so the paint doesn't just all run out the, the end. Okay, so gravity, gravity feed, double action, internal mix. Okay, so it might sound like I'm trying to sell airbrushes, but in actuality, there's many places to get airbrushes. Some of the different manufacturers, Pache, Iwata, this Aztec came out a few years ago. I've never heard much about them. Um, they didn't seem to catch on a lot, but I also remember Badger, and I'm sure you do too, they, they were around in all the hobby shops, everybody that wanted to airbrush 30 years ago, we, we all started with Badger airbrushes. Um, this Iowata is kind of considered the, the hallmark of excellent airbrushes, they're quite spindy, but if you ever find an artist, they'll usually always have an Iwata. Uh, they're very nice. I actually used one one time and it was like, wow, this is like the most machine prestigious piece of equipment I had in my hand. Um, that's nice, but they're kind of spendy. I wanted to also emphasize though, Master, quite inexpensive. So you can get the whole airbrush, needles, and a hose, a quick disconnect, a really nice little setup. This is, I just cut and paste this off of the Walmart's website and you can get it for $40. It's very inexpensive. So your question probably is, is, so what's the difference in your airbrush? Well, it comes back to a very simple, that the more expensive the airbrush, you've got machine parts versus stamp parts. These are made of brass, they're stamped. Uh, they, these are got machine parts around the nozzle. The nozzle is very carefully placed into uh, the head of the, the airbrush so that you can make that dagger stroke very nicely. These will also do it, but not quite as perfect. But then you have to ask yourself, are you an artist or do you just want to paint something and give it coverage? You can do this kind of artwork with a very inexpensive airbrush. So um, that's, the takeaway from that slide of uh, got a whole price range and this slide.
talking about your air source because this is the old compressor that we used to have out in our garage. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with that. And if you were going to do airbrushing, uh, that was basically what you were looking at getting. Uh, what's transpired, I actually missed a slide here. Well, rather than going back because we're kind of getting short for time. What's transpired in the last few years is this little setup that has become so popular is because the makeup industry and cake decorating has become so popular that these are being mass produced at a greater quantity and therefore the price has come down substantially. And so you can get the airbrush, double action gravity flow and a little compressor for about $60. So this will set you up so that you can do painting and uh, our building like the Woodland Scene Building, this little system would do that very nicely at your kitchen table using acrylic paint because there's really no odor and no mess. Uh, just a couple of things about air pressure. So this little system is gonna be about 15 pounds of pressure. It's a little slower in coverage, but it does work great for weathering and small projects. Uh, you can start going up with a table air compressor that uh, a lot of paints are geared around about 20 to 25 pounds of pressure. Uh, when you get up to about 30 to 50 pounds of pressure, bad things start to happen because you're starting to sandblast and water pressure and it'll make your way or your paint start to have waves in it. That's what they refer to as orange peel sometimes because your paint's starting to get plastic or it's starting to set, but then you're hitting it a lot with air pressure and all those little particles and they're actually like little particles going in and splatting on the moon and you're ending up with little craters. So that bad things can happen. And I can attest to this last one because I always push things to the limit and um, at about 70 pounds of pressure, this hose will pop on you. So, but uh, one other thing about, um, double action air brushes that you can action, actually use it kind of as a pressure washer. Say you want to wash your uh, train car before you paint it. You can actually just put alcohol or window cleaner in your airbrush and then actually pressure wash your car to clean it. So with that, I think that we're done. And if there's any questions, um, I don't want to take too much time, or, but I, I will be here if you have any questions. Yes. Yes, the Micro Mart just advertised one not too long ago, and I've seen them on a couple of other sites. Yes, yes. I I have an experience. My understanding is it's a, a it's a battery, and so what they did is they well that that small air compressor when you when you take it apart and look inside, it's actually just a very small little uh, piston motor that's going back and forth. Um, that one happened to the one I showed you there. It's very small, it's a fits in your hand. Um, so they just took that little air compressor and put it in the bottom of a little canister that's about the size of a Red Bull can. And uh, then there's a lithium battery. So it's on demand air pressure that's right there in the, the handheld unit. It just depends on whether or not uh, you you're, don't mind or whether you don't want to be tethered to that air hose. So I, I suspect it is the same air compressor in both of them. They're, they're, they're very small. Anyway, yes. Okay, a couple of good, good points there and a couple of things to, to address. Um, yes, Floquil was a flat finish. And so, yes, we wanted to put down a gloss finish to make that decal film fade away. One of the things about acrylic glues is they tend to have a semi-gloss finish. 
And if you've used them, you'll notice that that semi-gloss does a real good job of hiding your decal film. There's another benefit too, because now you're working like water slide decals, you're working all with water. When that glue, that acrylic glue that we talked about isn't quite set up and you float your decal onto place and now it's all drying, that glue actually helps hold on the decal too. So it's really kind of a double benefit whammy there. So now to answer your question, you have this semi-gloss finish and the question is, how do I now blend it all together? Because like you mentioned, dull coat was one of the things we used to be the go-to. I personally haven't used it. I've been told numerous times though, dull coat came in those little cans for what, six, eight bucks, something like that. You can go into the, um, the craft stores. I, I keep thinking, you know, you probably go in the craft store. I always go to the craft store with my wife when she goes because there's all kinds of stuff in the craft store. And over in their paint section, they have flat finish acrylic sprays that you can use in replace of dull coat. And so you get a great big can for the same amount of money and it's basically the same stuff. Now, one other tidbit is that when you go to weather, and I would suggest trying this before, you know, on a sample or whatever, when you spray acrylic glues with some of the pigments, if you do them as a transparent application, like you're gonna do weathering, a lot of times it'll end up very flat finished simply because you're looking at the pigments and it, and it flattens everything out. I was very surprised about that. So that's another option too. Uh, I have used the rattle can, but I actually have gotten to the place where I just use, well, I call it dust, that's our color but the dust has a lot of that titanium pigment in it and it's got that acrylic glue and if you're putting it down transparent it will end up looking like a flat finish um just a little side tidbit if you ever want to mix up paint and everything talcum powder is actually what you can use to make flat so if you have like a gloss acrylic glue and you mix talcum powder with it it'll make it flat so, yeah, yeah. In good point, and actually, when you go into the craft store, uh, depending on how many you want to try and buy, and but a lot of that stuff, uh, there's they're a lot the same. Um, because acrylic glues, there's not that many different types of acrylic glues and they, they just use different carriers. So it's a matter of just trying them and, and seeing if you like it. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. And... Yeah, yeah. In fact, when you mentioned Krylon, that's what the person was telling me, and that's actually at the craft store. Krylon is when they carry. And yeah, well, that's four dollars. But one of the things Sally will also tell you is, is that when you go with your wife, she can use her forty percent coupon, and you get to use your forty percent coupon. <laughs> so it's really quite inexpensive. So, so anything else? Well, my pleasure. I appreciate being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. No. Okay. Well, thank you.